Hello, I'm Catherine Zeta-Jones, and I play Theo in The Haunting, a film from DreamWorks Pictures, also starring Liam Neeson, Owen Wilson, and Lily Taylor. It was such a privilege for me to work with these wonderful actors, but the real star of The Haunting is not human. It's a house, a house that lives, breathes, and hates. I've been looking for, for scripts like this. Action! Adult, contemporary horror story for a long time, but also that would be classy and more intelligent and smart and character-based. It was just thrilling to read something and get kind of chills in the spine. The Deep Dark Night of the Soul, as Fitzgerald called it. I think, oh, it's great to have a film like this now, you know? A character-driven, psychologically-based, scary, scary movie. And so when we were lucky enough to find out that the book, The Haunting of Hill House, was available, we jumped on it. I'm Dr. Merrill. Welcome. Hello, Dr. Merrill. Welcome to Hill House, everyone. Ultimately, it's about this house, but there's four characters in this house who were brought there under false pretenses. They said there was going to be research about the sleep disorder, and those people are all insomniacs. What do we all need in life? What are the basics? Food, water, shelter. Sex. And sleep. Liam Neeson plays Dr. Merrow, who is a psychologist um, and an experimenter coming to this house. But he has another agenda, and nobody that has come on this journey with him knows about it. Between all these tests, you'll have each other and the house to keep you company. My character's determined that he'll be totally in uh, control of the whole situation, and of course, things happen that, <laughs> that he can't explain, you know? And they just get worse and worse. What do you want? Lily Taylor plays now, who is the person who is the most vulnerable and the most affected by her stay in the house. And she has such a wide spectrum that you believe her and you feel for her and you live the experience that she's having. Ever since I was little, I took care of my mother and, and she would wake up in the middle of the night. She would bang with her cane on the wall. And it's weird because even though she's dead, I still hear it and I wake up. There's seven subtle psychological things that happen before the first physical thing. And then the first things are in the evening. Sometimes at night, they could hear sounds coming from the old house. And there could possibly be just things in the house. None of them are proved. And then each event gets bigger and clearer. <laughs> Well, Catherine Zeta-Jones plays this woman who's wild, who has no barriers, who pushes the envelope as far as she can. Wow, you're so dominant. Thanks. Why the Adams Family Mansion? Because I had to be honest, I don't get a real strong sleep vibe from this place. Mm -hmm. Owen Wilson brings this, this, this fresh air to, to the movie. You know, he's funny, he questions this house. You know, he comments on what is going on. Well, that's why we're here, Eleanor, to try and help you. Yeah, now I think what Dr. Mero is trying to say is that you're a basket case, just like the rest of us. <laughs> I play Luke, and he's sort of a graduate student who kind of does these experiments, these paid psychological studies to make money. And so he's been through these tests before, and I think he knows what's going on. So he's sort of cynical about the whole process. I don't know, I just think Dr. Mero's up to something. I'll tell you another thing. I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. And when things start to happen, and the sounds, the darkness start to play with the mind. Oh, God, God. They start to create so much fear that they start, you know, accusing each other. Welcome home, Eleanor. What does that mean? Is this one of your sick jokes, Luke? What? You really think I wrote that? You found it, you could have. Oh, with what, with the 20-foot ladder that I keep in my back pocket? I love the script for The Haunting, and I was looking forward to working with the man who had directed such gut-wrenching and exciting films as Twister and Speed. But The Haunting takes us on a journey of the mind as much as an adventure of the body, and I wondered how director Yann de Bont would handle this new kind of challenge. 
So it's just gonna be like, where can I throw the camera left or right and let them sit upside down? Yeah, I know, I hear the stories. It's like, but at the same time, you know, it is, I know it's so important, you know, this, the emotion in this movie is very important. I mean, how, the fear, how the, the, to, to show the fear in a character, you have to know the character. Have you ever kept something to yourself because you were afraid? All the time. Jan's very participatory, he's very involved, and I, I love that with directors. Jan just stood right behind the camera, you know, moving around and pretending he was the entity for me. Action! Even death, you wouldn't let them go. Jan also gave us plenty of psychological motivation during the shooting of The Haunting by employing heavyweight talent such as Academy Award winning production designer Eugenio Zanetti to design a set so scary that none of the crew would stay on it after dark. Physical effects supervisor John Fraser devised set pieces that actually came to life. Action and hit! And Academy Award winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom who came up with a library of scary sound effects that set the tone for terror. Action! And cut. Cut. That was a good sound. All that psychological stuff didn't stop Jan from putting us actors through our paces on the set of The Haunting. I liked my actors to do their own stunts. I hate it when I have to use stunt doubles. I want to see the actor reacting to something right around him. The more that you can get practical elements that the cast members can interact with, the level of on-set performances far outweigh an actor improvising. It has been a physical production. In fact, there's a painting right over there that I, in a psychotic rage, have to jump up and begin pounding away with a candlestick at the painting of Hugh Crane. And I did that stunt myself. As I was pounding away, like part of the uh, candlestick came undone and it bounced off and hit me right in the chin and I had to get stitches. Right after I went to my psychotic rage, the house pays me back by giving me the magic carpet ride where this carpet gets jerked out and dragged 60 yards through the house. And everybody comes running up to me, yelling. Catherine and uh, Lily, when they run, they run, you know? I'm like, hey, guys, wait. I feel like dobbing the big horse, go boom, 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 boom. These guys are like, ah. Catherine's like a, I call her the Welsh gazelle, you know, she's like, Whew. I can't run anymore. The Welsh gazelle has a nice ring to it, but take my word for it, running in those spiked heel boots was no picnic. Jan's efforts to keep us in the moment paid off, though, with some uniquely terrifying sequences. Ah! 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 Director Jan de Bont is master at creating tension and terror on screen. But what is it about scary films that people find so irresistible? The producers of The Haunting are Donna Arkoff Roth and Susan Arnold, and they should know. Donna and Susan share more than a passion for movie making. They share a unique Hollywood history. Donna's father, Sam Arkoff, produced dozens of scary movies with colorful titles like The Beast with a Million Eyes and I Was a Teenage Werewolf. And Susan's father, director Jack Arnold, gave a generation of filmgoers many a sleepless night with his cult classics, including The Creature from the Black Lagoon and It Came from Outer Space. I definitely think that growing up in a family with a father who made horror films absolutely whetted my appetite to make a film like this because the first movies that I ever saw were horror films. And, you know, I used to come after school to, you know, sell Girl Scout cookies and there would be, you know, a fake rock with dry ice behind it and a guy in a monster suit and he would take his, his whole head off and sit there and eat a ham sandwich. It's just a great thing to be able to have found a project that actually is a tribute to our fathers. I like very much that the genre has come full circle in my family, and it makes me very happy to be able to have it passed down from one generation to another. I say that if you were injected with this, you'd revert to a primitive anthropoid. Shrieking of mutilated fit in these walls, limbs twisted and broken. I always liked genre films. I think The Pit and the Pendulum was as good a terror picture as there was. 
Producers and directors like Arkoff and Arnold had started a trend, and it wasn't long before the major studios were making big-budget, high-production-value horror movies. Some of my co-stars were among those shivering in the audience at this new generation of psychological horror movies. I'm a fan of the scary genre, like Rosemary's Baby, Shining, Exorcist. I mean, they're smart and really scary, terrifying. And that's what this, I feel like this, that's what this would be. I just loved the scary movies as a kid and growing up, and, and it's great to be part of, part of this one. Well, I think horror has always appealed to people. I mean, if you go back into ancient times, there were always horror stories. They used to tell them around the fireplace. They used to get a thrill uh, and a chill and a fright. Fear is great as long as you can control it, as long as you can explain it. The moment you can't explain it anymore, then you're in trouble. <laughs> I think it's good to get scared. I think we need it. Now, let me shut this door and give you a little privacy. I think we just need it, like, for the natural adrenaline rush. I think we need it to kind of grapple with some things we're wrestling with, things we're afraid of, and we need to see through stories, myth, people standing up to the things that scare them, seeing them go through it, and then come out the other side. Growing up with my father made me appreciate the value of entertaining people. Oh, my father would have been so excited. Uh, he would have been so happy. You know, one of the things that he always said was that the scariest thing is what you don't see as opposed to what you do see. So your imagination is, is the most frightening thing of all. What you think is around the corner. From all around the world, there are truly chilling stories of spirits who will not leave their earthly abodes. It's difficult to come up with a rational explanation for what goes on in these haunted houses. The haunting is set in New England, but to find a suitably grand and spooky exterior, we went to the nation that claims more haunted houses than any country in the world, England. Harlickson Manor, where we spent the last two weeks of production, turned out to have a ghost story of its very own. Uh, students have claimed that they have seen a ghost late at, late at night uh, in the library or at other places in the, in the place when they've been there by themselves. Mrs. Vanderelst was the owner of this house between 1938 and 1948. She uh, was a widow and she kept her husband's ashes in an urn, which she used to put on a mantelpiece in one of the rooms here and used to have seances in that room trying to call her husband's spirit back. And so the ghost in the house is Mr. Vanderelst, uh, whose spirit has permeated these walls. Haunted houses abound in the vicinity of the mansion as well. Nick Hughes manages the Angel and Royal Hotel, where a white lady has been seen floating in an upper hallway. It was supposedly the mistress of an innkeeper who was uh, having an affair. I mean, I've worked in hotels, uh, one near Peterborough, and there, the, Mary Queen of Scots state before she was executed at Fotheringhay. And definitely, I mean, I've been in a room there where, yes, the whole room goes cold in the middle of the summer and, and the doors start rattling. And it is true, they say it's the ghost of the Queen before she went off. As she was being escorted to her awful fate, poor Mary grabbed onto the banister of the Talbot Hotel with all her might. The embedded print of her signet ring can still be seen in the newel post. There is no shortage of haunted houses in the United States either. Sarah Winchester, widow of the man who manufactured the repeat action rifle, began building this amazing house in Northern California in 1884 and continued adding rooms, hallways and whole wings until her death 38 years later. Work went on 24 hours a day as she tried desperately to escape the ghosts of those killed by her husband's rifles. Sarah claimed to have gotten the plans for the building directly from the spirit world. And the many false stairways, doors to nowhere and meandering hallways seem to justify the belief that this place was not designed for human habitation. The very best kind of ghost story, though, is one from an eyewitness. Author Astrid St. Auburn recounts some terrifying tales in her book, Ghostly Encounters. In the book, Respected British actor Roy Detrice tells the story of his hair-raising encounter with a very malevolent spirit. It all began in 1950, when he, his wife Kay, and their young daughter Michelle moved into an apartment in the industrial town of Bolton, where they were performing in the local theatre. I guess it all started 
one night when we, Kay and I were asleep in the front bedroom and we heard the most appalling screams coming from little Michelle's room. So we rushed in there and put on the lights and the windows and the curtains which had been closed were now wide open and the room was immensely cold and she couldn't talk. She was <laughs> and suddenly she looked up at me and said, that man that came to me, he didn't have any hands, only sticks. The following night, the family cat panicked at the entrance to Michelle's room. And when Mr. de Triest entered, he found the windows had once again been opened and the room was unnaturally cold. After another sleepless night, Mr. de Triest sent his family to stay with relatives. And that very first night that they'd gone, I was asleep in the double bedroom and I woke up. I couldn't breathe. There was something around my neck trying to strangle me. And I, 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 I fought as I never fought in my life before or since, till eventually I threw it off. And I went to, there was a little mirror over the dressing table, and I looked in the mirror, and there was these long, thin, red marks, like thin fingers around my neck. I got to know the editor of the local paper, and he allowed me to delve into the archives, and the only kind of clue I could get why I thought this happened was that in 1873, a man had murdered his wife and two small girls, daughters, in that house, and then cut his own throat. I've only had one experience, and I'm glad I had it, because that was pretty much what I kind of remembered all throughout this, you know, was some of how terrified I was, because it's so unknown. I'm Irish, and we always grew up believing in fairies and goblins. Oh, definitely, yes. I believe in ghosts. Well, I don't really quite believe in that stuff, like my character. It's a realm I don't like to mess with, really. I respect it. I don't, it's not somewhere I want to go, because it's scary. It's really scary. Hill House feels like the creation of evil spirits. But in fact, it took an army of flesh and blood carpenters and some Academy Award winning talent to give the mansion a terrifying life of its own. God, it's so terrifying. In such a moment, we decided that it was like a human being in the house, that, that the house represent. Uh, it's a person in a way, he's alive, and the house actually performs like an actor. If Hill House is a character in The Haunting, then Academy Award-winning production designer Eugenio Zanetti is its costume designer, makeup artist, and acting coach. It feels evil basically because of the emptiness. The house is very ornate, there's a lot of statues, there are animals everywhere, there's all kinds of things, but basically there is this huge air space and I think void is what gives us fear no? darkness. When the whole sort of idea of the movie and the premise is a house that's haunted, you better have a house that's really terrifying and something that people haven't seen before. So it was a relief to see these sets and see what they had kind of put together with the house and see that it is in fact pretty awe-inspiring. And it's the biggest set I've ever seen. It must have been what like Cecil B. DeMille's band, her sets were like, you know, in the chariot race, these huge edifices. The house is a key character in this movie, and to create that character, we've had to manufacture and design architecture to make it come to life. We have an enormous amount of people, 300 carpenters, 40 sculptors, 25 painters, lots of people, draftsmen, illustrators, art directors, we have 300 people working. Eugenia came up with this incredible combination of Gothic, Victorian style mansion, which actually where in which every room has a different style and character. <laughs> oh, this is so twisted. And it worked perfect for the movie because everywhere you go, it's like it's something new. You discover something totally different. This house, it's it's oppressive, it's dark, it's like there's dead flowers, you know, and even little details I'll leave around. Like in the greenhouse, he'd left like a little macabre animal trap. And all of those, like if you're filling up a canvas, it all makes that canvas richer and fuller. So it's rich, it's very rich. The moment you come in there, there's something strange with this place, man. There's something really weird stuff going on. I think that the only way to convey fear is to go back inside and to look into your own fears. So I went back to my childhood, and then I found <laughs> a couple of fears there. Eugenio did a fantastic job of making Hill House beautiful and scary at the same time.
but the house also had to perform and interact with the cast. That required the collaboration of two teams of special effects virtuosos. John Fraser is a physical effects expert who devises and builds the kind of practical effects that can be done during filming. Continuity-wise, it's pretty much that. Computer right? effects it's wizard so Phil stuff. Tippett is renowned for his character Thank performance you. animation. The two teams began meeting with Jan and Eugenio before one frame of film was shot. The belief of, of Hill House and the way it comes to life has to involve an integration of practical effects and visual effects. One particular sequence, for example, Nell's bedroom when she's being attacked by Hugh Crane involves sections of walls and architecture within her bedroom that start to come down upon her and make her feel incredibly claustrophobic and trapping her. We like to do everything live, you know. We pride ourselves on, no, we can do that, we can do that. So we take it to the limit. The room that we designed hydraulically to collapse on Nell in her bed that will probably be 15% physical effects and 85% CGI. The rule of thumb that we use, if it's near the actor, it's going to be live. And if it's within 25 feet away, it's probably going to be CGI. The moment you can give an actor something real to look at, something real to react to, it instantly is 10 times better, 100 times better. So the performance is fantastic. <laughs> Physical effects crew achieved some amazing results in the haunting, but there were some places where only computer animation could take us. Scenes like this one, where a griffin attacks me, Lily and Liam, are constructed largely in the computer. First, we acted out the scene, pretending we saw the awful creature coming alive. Later, the griffin was animated at Tippett Studios. And then everything was seamlessly integrated into one shot. One of the interesting things about watching visual effects being shot is that you'll see the scene and there will be somebody carrying a big ball with cotton stuck all over it and it's used as a reference. But when you see it happening, it almost looks so absurd. But one of the beauties of making the haunting in the 90s is the fact that you can have at your fingertips these great visual effects. The biggest challenge for the animators was creating the ghostly entity that is the evil heart of Hill House. I wanted the house to come really alive in a very organic way. And that is, of course, when we had to, to bring in the help of people like Phil Tippett, who is so incredibly brilliant and who's so great in, in character animation. OK, so it looks like the, the yeah, ceiling I, is forcing the palmettos down? Yeah. Or... When you're trying to imagine a, a ghost, or a spectral entity, it kind of exists differently in the mind of every person. You know, ghost stories are scary because everybody is bringing their own fears to it and it's a mental construct. So that was really the trick in, in this show. For a lot of things we do, bugs, dinosaurs, robots, there is a certain amount of reference that you can find. You know, you can go and look at how real robots move or study animals for types of behavior. But a ghost is pretty tough. Nobody really knows what a ghost looks like or hopefully you don't know what a ghost looks like. We know what a house looks like. We know what a wall does. And when a wall comes apart, it has to be real. It has to be totally three-dimensional. And it has to have a character. And so it creates emotion. For the next layer of terror, Jan went to seven-time Academy Award-winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom, who created a symphony of scary sound effects for The Haunting. What I loved about the script was that it was, it was very descriptive of the sound. So much of the story is being told with sounds that characters hear when they don't see something early on. And what is that? Sound and fear are, are, are for me, very, well, very closely related. The smallest sound can set up the biggest fear, the darkest fear. Sound is such an emotional thing. You know, one of the best emotions to get out of sound is fright. So to me, it's about what scares us. And, and from my end, I get to really play with that. Jan's been very careful to build this film on a level of sustained creepiness. And that's been the uh, intriguing and interesting thing for us. I mean, there are certainly 
action, exciting, tension-driven, you know, set pieces as well. But Jan's two directions throughout this has been subtle and freaky. Oh, my God, what's happening? It's scary in, in, a, in the more fundamental, a primitive sense, and the, the kind of stuff that scares us all from childhood on. Sounds and sights and feelings that are just basic, frightening things that we all worry about. So it's not overt, it's more this covert, psychological, scary movie. All the world-class talent that went into the haunting makes the unimaginable seem perfectly plausible in the twisted halls of Hill House. What makes the haunting so frightening is that indefinable connection it has to what scares us the most, our own primal childhood fears about what's under the bed, what's in the closet, and what's in the deepest regions of our subconscious. It's really frightening and it's really beautiful. It assaults your senses in every way. Let yourself be scared. I mean, that's the best thing to do when you're watching a scary movie. I would describe it as a big, entertaining, scary movie. You sit with your popcorn and your soft drink and you're gonna have a great ride. I want to thank you for being brave enough to join me on this inside look at The Haunting. I have to go now because it's getting a little late and I'd like to get out of here before it gets too dark. Okay, guys, that's not funny. Can somebody turn on the lights? Come on, somebody turn on the lights. It's, it's too dark in here. Please, will somebody please turn on the lights? Please? <laughs>